Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see everyone here on this beautiful day and all of our friends online. I, uh, I have to say that the best gift I think I ever received as a child outside of my salvation was my green two-speed kickback Schwinn bicycle. It was, it was, I think, 60 years ago this month that my dad wheeled that bicycle into the dining room on my birthday, and I went crazy. I was jumping up and down. First bike I had, and I fell in love with it. And I put thousands of miles on that bike, because shortly after I got the bike, I got a paper route. That's in the olden times for you younger ones, you know. I had 120 customers on my route, and I wore the papers in a, in a shoulder bag, front and back. And it was a rural route. Three boys had it before I had it, and they did it together, those brothers. And so it, it was a challenge. And I'd be riding up Springwater Hill on a two-speed bike, and I could, with all those papers on my back, I couldn't make it up. About halfway up, I had to hop off and wheel it up because there was one customer, one customer at the top of that hill that you had to go past these apple orchards to get up there and put that paper in the tube. But it was good. It was good exercise. It was an afternoon route, and uh, I usually started around 3 when I got off the bus from school, and a lot of times wasn't done until 6 o'clock. But that green Schwinn, I loved it. But I also got wild and crazy on that bike. I did all kinds of stunts I shouldn't have done on that bike, and I crashed several times on that bicycle. And in one crash, I suffered an injury on my left foot. Right on the ankle bone and right above it, there was a deep gash. And it hurt. It really hurt. But it scabbed over. And uh, the, the difficult thing is, I kept knocking the scab off. Not once, not twice, not three times. I think five times I knocked that scab off my ankle. And I would re-bandage it, and my mom poured peroxide on it, and it would sizzle and fizz and everything. But one day, with the bandage on, it started really, really hurting. So I unwound the bandage, and it was angry. It was so red, and the scab was kind of broken up, and pus was oozing. At, sorry if you just had breakfast. Pus was oozing out all over the place. And so more peroxide and more topical stuff, but it was not getting any better. So off to the doctor we went. And that wound required a shot and some other medicine because that infection was deep and it was serious. At first, it was just a normal scab and it was healing. But every time I knocked that scab off, I interfered with the healing process and opened myself up to a much more serious infection. And that's what happened. Dear people, we live in a fallen world, a world that is filled with pain, and we all get hurt. Who in this sanctuary has not experienced betrayal. Some of you have experienced abuse of one kind or another. Some of you have been wounded by gossip or slander. Who in this room has not been taken advantage of? 
Who's, who's not been fired or mistreated in some way that, that cut to the very quick? All of us. Yet there is something, something much, much worse than the initial wounds we suffer. It is a secondary infection. It is a poison that when it's coursing through our veins, if it's not dealt with, it can ultimately destroy us. Just this past year, lost a dear brother from our Morning Star family. An infection just took over his body. Seemed to be otherwise healthy. Thankfully, went to be, he, he went to be with Jesus, but wow. How does that secondary infection set in? How does that take place? Well, it often occurs when we fixate on our feelings as victims, whether it's real, exaggerated, or imagined, we see ourselves as victims. And what we do is over and over again, we hit the replay button to relive the offense that was committed against us. And then we allow anger and resentment to grow. We find ourselves fantasizing about how we could retaliate for the injustice that was perpetrated against us or someone that we know and love that didn't deserve to be hurt. All of this suggests to us what the scriptures refer to as a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness. Let's look at it in Hebrews chapter 12. It speaks to this issue of bitterness. Hebrews 12 and verse 15. It says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. We were just recently in the book of Hebrews a couple weeks ago with a, a lesson on entering rest, which is trust, in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. So let me just refresh your memories a little bit this morning. We learned that the writer of Hebrews was deeply concerned for some Jewish Christians who were struggling in their faith. When you read the book of Hebrews, it reads less like a letter and more like a sermon. A sermon from a pastor who's deeply concerned about his congregation. And quite frankly, he should have been concerned because it appeared as if his congregation was coming apart at the seams. It was imploding. There were messes everywhere. I went to lunch with a friend a couple weeks ago. He spends half the year in California, half the year here in Oregon. He gets around the country. He talks to a lot of people, knows a lot of believers. And he, in the middle of lunch, just bluntly asked me, how, as a pastor... Do you keep from getting discouraged? I mean, so many people are messed up. And the church is so full of messed up people. How do you keep from getting discouraged? And I just agreed with him. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. You will find no shortage of messes in the church. 
Ministry is really, really messy. It seems like at every turn there are incoming missiles, fiery darts of the enemy. It's like the church has a big bullseye on it because the enemy of all things good is at work constantly to tear things down. I said, yeah, it's true. Ministry gets very messy. The church attracts a lot of people who are hurting, as it should. It's not just a school where people are taught. It's a hospital where people can have their wounds healed through the grace of Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, the church is messy. But we are told in God's word, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And her wedding gown, yeah, it's muddy and dirty. Doesn't look like she's ready for the wedding. But she will be. God is getting the church ready for the return of his son, Jesus Christ. When he said, how do you keep from getting discouraged, Pastor? I said, well, God has blessed me with the most wonderful wife in the universe who oozes encouragement out of every pore of her body. That's a, that's a huge help. But really, I, I do get discouraged. I'm not some superhuman that, that never gets discouraged. But I think... It, it is manageable only because I am constantly seeking to hear from God's word. I am laser focused on studying and knowing and understanding, listening to the voice of God through his word and prayer. And I want my opinions formed by the influence of God's word, not the noisy clutter of the culture that's going downhill fast. I want it to come from the word of God. Well, there were lots of problems in the first century church. I mean, there are lots of problems with the people of God in general. Go back to the people of God wandering in the wilderness, 1445 B.C., <laughs> Go to the first century church. Take the church of Corinth where there were all kinds of problems in the church of Corinth. Immorality and division and all kinds of things. And fast forward to the 21st century church. Yes, we have problems. Some of them are very difficult. But what was going on with these first century Jewish Christians? What were some of the problems in that church? Well, some of them were drifting away. They were just nonchalant, weren't really as serious as they should have been about following hard after Jesus. Some of them were becoming indifferent as they drifted. Some of them, these Jewish Christians, wanted to return to a life of rules, rituals, regulations. They just felt more comfortable within the borders of the law of Moses. And they were trying to mix that law of Moses with faith in Jesus Christ. That never, never, never works. And so the writer of this pastoral letter, or the deliverer of this sermon, I should say, which is the book of Hebrews, again and again he's telling them, listen, Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is the greatest high priest, the only high priest you need. And then some of them in the church, they just weren't maturing in their faith. They were standing still. They were in neutral for God, whatever that means. It usually means you're not, you're not moving forward. You're sliding backward when you're in neutral. And then some of these dear people, because of such intense pain and persecution they were suffering, we're just thinking about giving up altogether. Just getting out of the race. So chapter 12 in Hebrews starts out with encouragement. And the pastor says to his congregation, 
Let us run the race with endurance. Let's set aside all the sin that weighs us down. I don't know if you saw the, the world track event at Hayward Field down in Eugene, but uh, I, I happened to catch some races in that event. Always impressed by those athletes. Always impressed. But there was one young woman that was so impressive. I heard her in an interview, and I just, I said to myself, I said to my wife, she's got to be a believer. There was just something glowing about her. And uh, her name was Sydney. She ran the 400 hurdles. And I mean, she broke the world record. Broke the world record. But you know, they wear as light a clothing as possible when they run. She did that in something like 50 point some seconds. Amazing. Amazing. And then later I saw she posted something on social media giving all the glory to God, quoting a verse of scripture. The writer of Hebrews says, Get rid of the weight. You are in a race. You are in a race. Get back in the marathon. Put your eyes on Jesus. Don't, don't look at yourself. Don't lick your wounds. Don't go soft. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't leave the arena. You may be hurting. You may be in pain. You may be limping. But move on. Don't give up. Look at our verse again. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. The writer says to them in chapter 12, you haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding blood. Look what Jesus did for you. Look what he went through for you. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And now he's seated at the throne of God, at God's right hand. He's finished his work. You need to finish the race. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. You know what I find fascinating about this verse? What I find so fascinating is where it appears, what it's sandwiched between. This verse is wedged between two accounts of intense pain. If you go up and look at around verses 4 through 13, there the pastor is, is talking to his congregation about how much of the pain we experience is pain that God gives us as discipline. And it can be intense. But he gives us this pain in discipline for our good, for our profit, some of your translations say. Why? Because God has the awesome task of making us holy so we will be prepared to dwell with him for eternity. That's no easy thing when the bride keeps diving into mud puddles. And so pain... Pain, the discipline of the Lord, there's pain. But you go down after this, where he talks about our preparation for eternity, and on the other side of verse 15 is the story of Esau. And this is not a pain that's inflicted by God. Esau's pain was self-inflicted. Do you remember the story of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob? He came in one day from out on the hunt. Esau was a man's man. And Jacob had a pot of stew, lentil stew, on the fire. 
And when Esau smelled that stew, he said, ah, I got to have that. I got to have that. And Jacob was conniving, manipulative, deceiving. Of the two twins, he was the rascal, really. Esau was more the gentleman, but he was a gentleman that had more concern for instant gratification. He saw what was right close to him, and he said, I'll have that. And he had no long-distance vision. And so when his twin brother, Jacob, said, you want soup? Okay, let's make a deal here. I'll give you soup if you give me the birthright. First rights of family inheritance. And Esau, you know, he, he essentially said, I'm whatever i'm gonna die if i don't eat right now so he wanted to satisfy his appetite right there to the neglect of spiritual things of the two twins jacob cared about spiritual things esau not so much not so much but then later when it came time for isaac their daddy to hand out the family blessing there wasn't anything there for esau at least not first place not first rights to the family inheritance. And the Bible says when you go back and read Genesis that Esau wept bitterly. His living his life for instant gratification left him at a place where he found no place for repentance, it says, though he sought it with tears. Now, I don't think that means that if he really wanted to repent... He couldn't do it. I think it simply means he couldn't turn things around because he had lived his entire life feeding his own selfish appetites first and neglecting the things of God. When it came down to the receiving of the family inheritance, he could not reverse that, even though he wept bitterly. So when we look at verse 15 and 16, we, we see three Knows. See to it that you don't do this or don't do that. And here they are. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. See to it that no bitter root springs up. And third, see to it that no one is immoral or godless. Yeah. That's good advice. People whose hurts have metastasized into bitterness are missing the grace of God. I mean, there's no better way to put it. People who are simmering and stewing with a root of bitterness have missed the grace of God. The very grace that gives a person joy and peace and fruitfulness in life they miss the grace so often because they're interested in meeting out justice justice I want justice and they often want to inflict pain on the people that have hurt them so deeply or someone that's close to them that's been hurt a lot of times bitterness isn't isn't coming on you because of something done to you, but someone very close to you, someone you care about. Yet, ironically, when a person is trapped in the throes of bitterness, no amount of suffering, humiliation, payback is sufficient to atone for the sins committed against them. If you've committed a sin, you need to pray and ask God to forgive you, and by his grace, he will forgive you. But if you commit a sin against me, I'm going to hold you accountable till the day you die, you dirty devil. That's the root of bitterness speaking. I look at it this way. Bitterness bypasses the cross. Bitterness bypasses the cross. It leaves no opening for the grace of God to operate because it maintains that sins against me or my people 
are always exceptions to the forgiveness and the grace of God. The truth is, there are no exceptions to the grace of God. His grace is greater than all my sin, as well as the sins that have been committed against me. That's just God's wonderful grace. That's God's amazing grace. Why should I say that sins I've committed can be forgiven, but sins you've committed against me must be held against you? When I refuse to let go, when I'm unwilling to forgive, when I deceive myself and think that I'm in a better place by wishing harm on you for what you've done, it is likely that I am watering a poisonous root of bitterness that can grow up and not just defile me, but anybody that comes in contact with me because that's, that's the thing the verse says there in Hebrews 12, 15, it's a bitterness by which many become defiled. Bitterness is contagious because the bitter person wants to gather defenders in their orbit and say, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And the bitter person loves it when their friend comes along inside and says, oh, I can't believe he did that to you. I can't believe she did that to you. What a rotten, rotten thing. And then another person comes along. They create an army of people who will drink the poison along with them and never once give consideration to the grace of God. Now listen, if you've been deeply hurt by someone, I am not saying you are required to trust that person. They may have hurt you in a way that it would be foolish to link forgiveness and trust together. We can forgive people. We can release them from what they did to us without trusting them. And I'm not saying that for your forgiveness to be real and genuine, you've got to go back to where the relationship once was. Sometimes that's not prudent, and that's not good. What I am saying is you must let Jesus do a work in your heart that releases the person that offended you. That's called first-order forgiveness. It doesn't necessarily restore everything. In fact, many times it doesn't. All it does is release you and release that person, namely, so that you're not holding anything over them. You put it into God's hands. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Now, if that person repents, and by repent I mean they are so repulsed by what they did. They are so sorry for what they did. But it's not just a sorry because of the act itself. It's sorrow before God. It's a godly repentance. And they truly repent. Then you can have what I call full circle forgiveness. We always have to be willing to forgive. But we can't technically go all the way other than releasing it to God unless that person repents. If they repent, then we get to have full circle forgiveness. But even sometimes with full circle forgiveness, the relationship isn't back, depending on what the sin was. It isn't back to what it, it was. But there's not, there's not a, a bitter, sinful, vengeful attitude in all of that. Back in 2003, I got to meet Pastor Adrian Rogers. I had heard him on TV many times. Wonderful, wonderful teacher of God's Word. And I, I got to have a discussion with him, and I told him, Dr. Rogers, you preached a sermon on bitterness years ago, and it has stuck with me. It was a wonderful teaching. 
And I just want you to know, we called and got permission to reproduce that on some CDs from your church, and it has helped so many people in our church in Salem, Oregon. And he gave me a big hug, and I thanked him for that. And I, I want to give you just a little bit of his outline here. He said, the seed of bitterness is hurt. That's almost always where it gets started. You've been hurt in some way. The soil of bitterness is a heart that harbors hostility. That's what allows that root to grow up, do all the damage it does. And then he talked about the devastation of bitterness and some of the symptoms or characteristics of people who are walking in bitterness. And here's some of them. They, they're usually very sensitive. They have little or no gratitude. It's hard for them to have a heart of worship with simultaneously a heart of hatred. Those just don't go together. These types of people will harshly criticize or vainly flatter. They're not really very realistic about healthy human relationships. These people hold grudges. Needless to say, when you're bitter, you're holding a grudge. And a lot of these people have mood swings. And some of them are, are pretty big mood swings. And, and, and that just is indicative of the fact that they're being controlled by the enemy. And then he talks about the chain reaction of bitterness. And I think the verse that that best reveals this chain reaction of a bitter heart is found in Ephesians 4.31. It says, let all bitterness, and then all these other things seem to be accompaniments of bitterness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That word malice refers to a desire to cause pain or injury, or distress to another person. Ugh, so ugly. According to the pastor here, writing to these Hebrew Christians, when your heart is harboring that kind of poison, you are in grave danger. You're in a place where you can actually miss out on the grace of God. So how do you get rid of bitterness? <laughs> Talked a lot about this poison and what damage it can do in the church. How do you get rid of it? Well, first of all, repent. You confess that attitude as sin before God. When you confess sin, that word literally means to say the same thing about the sin that God's word does. Now you know what God's word, I've told you what God's word says about bitterness. Now you've got to go before God on your knees and you've got to say, dear God, I think maybe one of the reasons I'm not moving ahead in my relationship with you, why I seem to be blocked, why I can't seem to hear your voice, why I can't seem to feel as though my walk with Jesus is a walk of blessing, and why I can't worship you the way you deserve to be worshiped given what you did for me through Jesus, your son, who died for my sins. God, forgive me. I agree with what your word is saying about how awful this poison is that I'm allowing to continue to course through my veins. Secondly, the way you deal with bitterness is you focus on God's grace toward you. It was your sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. And yet the good news of the gospel is that on the cross, he paid for all of my sins, and he's forgiven me. And that's the great news of the gospel, that my sins past, my sins present, my sins future are all forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's good news. What do I deserve, though? 
Has God given me what I deserve for the ugly sin that I've committed? For the ugly thoughts that I've entertained? No. He's not held those against me. So I'm not to hold those against people that have hurt me in hopes that they will be hurt. And then third, replace your bitterness with the pursuit of holiness. What, what does that mean? What does holiness mean? It means you're different, and it means you're pure. It means you're clean. You're not like everybody else in the culture. You're set apart. Really, to be holy is to be like God. And as I said, that requires some pain along the way and discipline along the way. But pursue it. Thank God for it. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Dear church, that, that verse really gives us our marching orders. We're to pursue peace with all men, every human being, and holiness. A pure heart, a pure mind, not a mind filled with, it's not fair. This shouldn't have happened to me. Those are true statements if someone has sinned against you. But clutching on to that, is an obstacle to the pursuit of holiness and peace with all people. And I don't know about you, church, but I don't want any of those obstacles in my heart. And believe me, in preparing this message, <laughs> I've had flashbacks to all kinds of hurts. It's almost like the enemy wanted to divert my attention from preparing this message to think about some of those hurts. And I just had to say, nope, I'm not going there. Yeah, that really hurt. I was really disappointed in that person. Yeah, that caused so much damage. But nope, nope, nope. There's another trajectory, and that's peace with all and the pursuit of being different, more like Jesus. Let his grace change everything for you. And don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words of wisdom from this sermon to the Jewish Christians in the first century. Lord, with all of the hurts and pains that exist today, I know there are those who, who have probably struggled and wrestled, in some cases wondering why they don't seem to be making progress in their journey of life with Jesus. And we've highlighted one significant problem this morning, that problem of a root of bitterness. And Father God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, we would be able to do an honest search and that you would help us clearly see if there are people against whom we are holding grudges people who have hurt us or have hurt someone close to us. And it has allowed uh, a, a pattern of thinking that is hateful, that is angry in a sinful way that is completely out of line with your grace. And I pray, I pray that we would receive a, a fresh <laughs> immersion today in your grace 
and see that your grace is not only greater than all our sin, but greater than the sins of those who have sinned against us. Help those, I pray, who have just taken themselves to the stands out of the marathon race, even those who are limping and hurting and in pain, and help them to see that they're, they're not going to be healed by sitting in the stands. They've got to get back in this race. They've got to get their eyes on Jesus and off of their own pains. Grant that, I pray, for your glory and for the health of your church, the bride of Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.